feel. We're going to share with you some amazing data points um, that, that influence the direction of where we're going to go today, which will influence our conversations today, really our four impact areas. We're going to talk about those. Then we're actually going to get into our working groups. We're going to engage you folks around two key areas. One is really around community engagement, focusing on inclusion and pollution. And then the other one is focusing on food systems and the value of food and material in the system and get your thoughts on those. We're then going to end up with, with, with reflections and share outs of what we've learned from each session and then open it up for a broad Q&A. So on that note, I thank you for putting your names in. I thank you for putting your time into the to the to the um, uh, uh, engagement here. And I'm going to ask a quick question for you. Um, when we look at right now what we're trying to ga gather, I think the key thing is how many people of you were actually with us for the workshop workshop one kickoff, whether that was an in person or virtual. So use your little clicker. By a show of hands, if you can just highlight you are here or you were not with us on the first one. If you were here, put your hands up. Love to see you, see you come through a little bit and see if you were here. So again, you can use your visually, you can raise your hand up or you can also um, just use your little uh, icon button to share that you were there too. So I see a couple of hands going up. Great, see you from Mark, great. Ash, great. Great, yeah, so wonderful. So some of the same, it's great that a lot of the people, the same folks that were here uh, with us on the first kickoff are, are joining us today, continuing that continuity. Thank you again for the time. So let's talk about some of the key themes we saw during that first workshop and share that out a little bit. Um, if you remember, we had four questions that we discussed in our breakout sessions in a sector context. What is your definition of the circular economy? What are existing examples of circularity in Cleveland? What are the opportunities a circular economy can bring? And what are the barriers currently in the way? Now, when we group the responses, what was fascinating is that the public and social sector, the variance was so small between what both sectors were coming out in their programs that we lumped those two together just because it was statistically irrelevant to separate them. And the private sector did have kind of their own feedback in their own lane, which is not surprising. And so let's dive in a little bit. So on the first question, what is your definition of the circular economy? First and foremost, both sectors, all three sectors, uh, responded that, that waste, turning waste into a reusable resource is something that's high up in the value of what circular economy means. And this is really interesting because this is a common perspective, which is great among the circular economy space. You don't have to have a detailed, um, nuanced um, definition using the L. MacArthur's definition or metabolic's definition or Pixar Global's definition to understand that waste streams and taking waste and turning it into resource is a critical part of the circular economy space. Um, on top of that, the private sector, they did use more corporate jargon to define what circular economy meant. Um, a lot of talk was around zero waste. There was talks about ESG and a lot of talk about sustainable supply chain. What was interesting with the public and social sector folks was Again, learning, turning waste into a resource and that acknowledging the current economic platform doesn't account for waste effectively, that the system does not work. And the last one, which I thought was fascinating was right before we even got into this, saying that the circular economy can really mean something more holistic, that it can mean a more inclusive and equitable economic platform. So right off the bat, insights came in that circular was not just about waste, but it was about lifting the lives and livelihoods of those, those folks who maybe have not been in the conversation to be as an equal and to lift them up um, through a circular economy platform. And that's powerful. And so I just wanted to make sure that you, know, you understand that there's a difference there. And that was really cool that you folks brought that out. When we got to what are the existing um, uh, examples of circularity in Cleveland, all three sectors were spot on pretty much saying the same thing. We saw the usual suspects. We saw Rust Belt Riders, the Upcycled Parts Shop, Rebuilders Exchange were the most popularly mentioned. And what was really fascinating was this context of reuse. It wasn't just about waste. There was a big concentration of folks looking at the waste streams or looking at circular in a reuse um, context, which is really important when you want to look at um, understanding and identifying entrepreneurial opportunities. But also speaking really specifically to the fact that the word circular economy is while it's maybe it's been, the concept has been around for a long time, the vernacular is kind of important now, but many of you folks are, have been doing this for years. Many of you folks have been engaging in the circular economy for years. 
Um, what we're trying to do in the space and why I want to harp on this for a little bit, especially with the social and public sectors in the conversation, is that we do not want to gentrify the word reuse. We don't want Patagonia, for example, to come in and say that reuse is something new. It's not. Community members have been using reuse and sharing economy for a long time. And we want to look at how we can have the city of Cleveland take ownership of that. Moving forward, opportunities. Now, this is where also there was some divergence, some really good inter interesting insights. The private sector's main focus of their insights of what they thought the opportunities were was around reputation management. Private sector was really looking to focus on the fact that they could do, they could build, rebuild the reputation and that it could, they could engage deeper and more authentically in the communities in the circular context, also with their communities, but also with their employees. And they feel that the circular economy could also improve the respective environmental, social, and government's metrics, which is um, a platform that uh, provides incentives to invest in for doing or showing social good. On the public and social sector, again, some themes came out again with waste and resource efficiency um, was a path to turn waste into a resource. But most importantly, I thought was really interesting was, again, looking at how you can use a circular economy to develop more meaningful and deeper engagement with the local communities. And looking at the time right now to use this platform as a way to really build constructive, authentic and meaningful dialogue between the local community and the public sector, between the local community and the private sector, and really represent those voices that have not been heard. And we'll get to that in a second with barriers. And so on barriers, let's continue this. I'll start with the public and social sector here. There was some really powerful insights that came from some of the responses. One response said that what we have to deal with is white nationalism, like front and center. And I think what I really appreciate and what we really appreciate from the folks that shared was the authenticity of the sharing and really calling out um, what the barriers are. So there was an overall theme of racism and accountability the high, as the highest number of response respondents were really painting a clear picture of the systemic racism and inequities that are pervasive in the current system. I do want to take a second to highlight that while it was authentic that this was coming out in Cleveland, Unfortunately, this is a common condition across not just the United States, but across the world and something again, when I highlighted earlier the opportunity to really put inclusive front and center into this project, this is an opportunity to address those needs. The other theme that came out from the public and social sector I really want to highlight was the barrier of counterproductive and a stagnant mindset really looking at it to where um, there was a lot of discussion on the short terminism that's really based on the public sector of what's the native trend, what's the latest theme, but not really thinking to the mid and long term, not really addressing the fact that is this just another platform of this is something nice and pretty, or is there going to be real meaningful engagement where you're actually hearing our voices and there's really an opportunity to maybe change, to put some policies in place to enable economic mobility or limit our pollution footprint, or actually create incentives and new businesses for those that have been not really getting those incentives in the past. So that's something that we hope to address as we move forward with this process. Conversely, the private sector, they said essentially that number one, response felt that the company's management circular is not top of mind yet. There's not the business case for circularity in the way they need to see it. And there's not yet incentives for middle level managers to spend resource on it. I wanna highlight this yet. Um, we think this is a trend that's coming through not just the United States, but the world. And so that's kind of also what we're trying to work on is shape that yet to there are resources for it. And last but not least, limited access to circular goods. Um, I thought this was interesting because Cleveland is heavy industry and manufacturing. So when we say limited access to circular goods, maybe this is something we can change where the supply chains become local for that access to circular goods. Maybe that's something we can address. But at the moment, there's not really the infrastructure to address it. And there's also an overall lack of logistics and support. So there you go. There is the feedback or the run of show of some of those insights. Um, I want to make a note here because we really want to spend our time engaging on these questions coming up. Uh, for you in our breakouts. Um, but just a word of note, if you have a question, we want to address it. There's going to be time at the end of the conversation to address it. Um, and we'll be able to stick around to answer any questions you have, any insights you have. Without further ado, though, I want to now spend some time on the big reveal and share with you um, how we've evolved um, today of where we are with um, our focus areas for Circular Cleveland and what the data shows. 
Um, a, word, a word of acknowledgement goes to our partners, Metabolic. Um, as many of you know, they're based in the Netherlands. Um, they're six hours ahead, and so they're not um, um, able to spend time with us this afternoon for this, for this uh, reveal. Um, so I will do my best to uh, highlight those data points the way that our colleague Tamara and Andrew would do, and, and Kristen and Divya hold me accountable if I make some huge, massive mistakes. So here we go. So all things serious, this is really cool and insightful stuff. What we've done is essentially is we've conducted a landscape analysis. And by what we mean by a landscape analysis is the following. We conducted a regional material flow analysis, which we'll share with you in a second, really looking at data points in all aspects of what the city is sharing out, all public forms of data, what the city has data to share. Um, note that there are some data points missing from the private sector, and we'll talk about how we can get some of that, those data points afterwards, but the data is really analyzed and crunched. We then also take into context to evaluate the existing waste strategies that exist in the city and also in the region to inform um, this, this analysis. We also look at policy. Obviously, we're examining policy when we come to this. So any uh, policy analysis related to sustainability, we're taking a deep dive on. And then you folks, we're gathering the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities of the city together with stakeholders such as you to really kind of figure out what those um, social, those priority issues are. And then we're working together to select those focus areas for Cleveland. And so here we go. What I'm going to share with you today then is a focus on that. Um, real quickly, for that, we frame all of this, though, in the seven pillars of the circular economy. And I want to highlight something here real quickly. Ellen MacArthur Foundation's definition of the circular economy and the three pillars is absolutely spot on and correct. There's nothing wrong with that. We use it ourselves in Pixera Global, for example, is a, is a, and along with City of Cleveland is a, is, a, is a really loyal and wonderful partner to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. What we're sitting here, though, is kind of the pillars of how we look at the circular economy within, I would say, um, the planetary boundaries of sustainability and really thinking through the inclusion piece a little bit more specifically. And so we look at it through these seven pillars here. We look at it through um, materials, energy, water, biodiversity, human society and culture, health and well-being, and that human activities generate value beyond just financial. Infrastructures and mobility options are sustainable. So when we look at it through that lens, we chose these focus areas, which allows us to allocate time and resources to the topics most relevant for Cleveland's communities. We can't tackle everything. So the focus areas identified here are the ones that we're really going to dive in and focus on as our priorities for this roadmap. Two, build upon the momentum of Cleveland's existing strengths and opportunities, as well as existing programs and initiatives. We want to find the lone hanging fruit, and while capturing and getting wins in the low hanging fruit, we want to make tangible progress to have systemic change happen in the city of Cleveland for its constituents and for its stakeholders. In that context, we're really trying to leverage those strengths and opportunities around these four focus areas. And last but not least, we want to really create that feasible roadmap, that implementation roadmap that addresses all these major environmental impacts, which we're going to get to today. So here are the four focus areas. Focus areas three and four, and by the way, they're not ranked by one has a higher priority than the other. So look at it as 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Focus area three and focus area four is what we're going to be discussing today. Remediating pollution and then looking at, um, excuse me, looking at uh, the valuing of resources. What we looked at really that has a lot of more private sector influence is, is focus area one, circular manufacturing. Uh, really focusing on heavy industry manufacturing and then focus area to the built environment. Obviously, one key point to bring here, technology is underpinning all four of these areas as well. We have some really wonderful stakeholders to help us with that too. So on that note, let's get into the gritty, a nitty gritty um, regarding more value from resources. What does this mean? So when we look at getting more value from resources, this means really looking at how do we divert waste, mix waste from landfill, and look at building on Cleveland's local initiatives, focusing on organics to close the nutrient cycle. So here, what it's really focusing on is that regenerative aspect, looking at taking these organic materials many times and then converting it actually into new or, or product that we can be used on a circular or loop basis. So what you see here is the model of how we do that. And what I really want you to pay attention to is when you look at, you know, for example, you'll see on the left side, um, all the way down, you see the data points, the small data points from resources, 
energy, water, and building materials. If you focus on the waste materials itself and the waste processing, you'll see, for example, on the circle on waste processing, um, the percentage of tons that are landfilled, recycled, and composted. If you see here on the composting side, you'll see that only 41,600 tons are relatively composted right now. And that's something that we see as a big area to grow. We see currently that landfilled by far 607,000 tons are, are currently landfilled, um, which of course you're gonna see building materials and concrete is a big portion of that. So for this sake of the conversation, I wanna really highlight what does this mean here in this space? So getting more value from resources. I think when you look here, if you look at waste production, um, kudos to the cities, of, to the constituents of Cleveland, residents in Cleveland produce way less waste per capita than the average US citizen, but far above the global average. So highly composed of organic. So note that compared to the United States, Cleveland, Cleveland produces less waste per capita, which is great. Of the mixed waste composition, 96% of collected household waste is sent to landfill, of which an approximately 31% is organic waste, and what do you think I want to focus here? 17% is food waste, 21% is paper, and 15% is plastic. So what when you see here, when you see that 31% of organic waste is landfilled, there's the opportunity to look at 17% food waste and yard waste to see what we can do with it. There's a lot of opportunity there. Urban agriculture, food waste, and composting infrastructure. Many initiatives and programs are in place around stimulating urban agriculture and diverting food waste. Infrastructures for composting, biomass to energy are already present, though. We want to highlight that, that Rust Belt Riders, Cuyahoga Composting Center, et cetera, they exist. I think I also think it's important to highlight here the importance of Cleveland in a regional context. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier one of the partners is the Council of the Great Lakes Region, and I think that's important because regionality is really critical to the circular economy, and also not just for Cleveland, but looking at Cleveland as a hub for the region potentially for organic waste. These are the opportunities that we have that we want to look at capitalizing and using that infrastructure that, for example, Rust Belt Riders, Cuyahoga Composting Center already have at play. Last but not least, the focus on transparency. Commercial and industrial organic waste data are not complete. There's a large unknown fraction in mixed waste. Again, not unique to Cleveland. This is across the board. Transparency of data is challenging, especially from the commercial sector. Um, I think one thing that we had a discussion that I want to highlight in the private sector conversation today was how do we get data to be shared broadly for all sectors to use the right way? And I think there's an opportunity with the potential for the private sector to look at data waste or waste data in a way where by sharing it, systems can be built, profits can be maximized, and we can really look at closing the loop on some of these waste streams. And some of these waste streams obviously are more valuable than others. On that note, let's continue. Again, I want to highlight some of the opportunities here. So valorization of waste, which really is the value of waste. We can increase the collection of separate waste fractions through scaling up an efficient curbside recycling program and other existing community programs. Circular entrepreneurship. This is something we really want to dive into and focus on with our ambassadors and with, with the folks who already have a culture of reuse and reduce and looking to take waste and make the most of it already. We want us to look at potentially stimulating local circular entrepreneurship around repair, reuse, recycling, and promote high value extraction of organic waste to close the loop on nutrient loops. Okay, smart connections. One thing we saw, there's a high percentage of vacant lots in the city of Cleveland. How can we utilize those vacant lots as maybe to close those nutrient loops and provide space for composting? How do we put a business model to it? What incentives could be put in place to be able to help do that? And how could we have those folks on the ground who are trying to cut their teeth to actually create small businesses in this space, grow and amplify their scale? Monitoring commercial and industrial organic waste. We can increase the monitoring of the waste flows to allow better diversion. This is really important, by the way, not just in Cleveland, but across the world, through synergies and innovative treatments. So better food processing industries, supermarkets and food service. And last but not least, which you're already doing in Cleveland, adopt high efficiency and low input circular cultivation methods, i.e. aquaponics, yay. Some examples of this that's already being done, I wanna highlight just, I think, Take a look at this. This is for yourself, but 
What we've tried to do as a team is organize to give you some ideas of ideas in other cities of what folks are doing. So one, um, obviously in Netherlands, you have a repair cafe. It's an organization that simulates the creation of repair cafes in Belgium and Netherlands through offering interested people practical, legal, social, and branding advice for starting a repair cafe. Like that's just a really cool idea to start a circular business model and engage. Um, pay as you throw San Jose in the United States it currently has a has a million inhabitants they implemented a pay as you throw system back in 1993 that resulted in an extensive annual savings on municipal solid waste costs and in a strong increase in recycling rates again that's something that's a low hanging fruit that maybe we can all tackle together right off the bat and the last but not least let's look at Barcelona. They have their hub for circular initiatives. Scrap Store 22 is a place to foster material exchanges between local business designers and artists. Again, creativity, bringing art to the front and center of the circular transition. On that note, we're gonna finish off here a little bit on what we're gonna discuss today is remediating pollution. How do we look at policies related to pollution um, for a healthy, thriving environment? And this matters to all sectors, but we really wanna put the engagement on the public and the social sector to get some really good insights today. Air quality. Cleveland fails to meet air quality, US according to uh, EPA standards. Polluted areas and green spaces. Cleveland has extensive polluted areas present as a result of past and present industry, and they have ongoing efforts to develop more green spaces and to increase tree canopy. How can we take a negative and make it a positive? How can we take to be a traditional industry and manufacturing hub and make it a green hub while also having jobs? That's what we need to answer. Water pollution, existing efforts to improve quality of waterways in Lake Erie, but unknown water output from all industries. And then we know the traditional problems with lead poisoning. There's a strong correlation between the racial composition of K through eight schools and the share of students with elevated blood levels in Cleveland Metropolitan School Districts. How can we help and protect our people, our constituents, our citizens from the harms of the environment which we're currently operating? So some highlights here, some ideas that we could work on. Apply regenerative bioremediation practices. Utilize remediation parks to clean up brownfield investments where there's traditionally really toxic waste streams. How do we maximize those use of those vacant lands? Looking at those ways to produce pilots for food production or growing biomaterials. How can we work together? How can we look across Lake Erie and look into our partners in Canada and really try to find solutions or and or look regionally with other US cities with similar mindsets and look to recycle wastewater, for example, between industries. Nutrient recovery, we've said enough there, I've already harped on a little bit, and then to build really strong climate resiliency, adopt natural-based solutions and increase green space, which would be great. Last but not least, here are some examples of what you need to focus on to take a look of what are some examples that can influence um, you here in um, Cleveland. Um, one thing I want to highlight here, aquaponics in Vienna, um, you already see the value of aquaponics in Cleveland, but I think this is a really uh, a program which you're already engaging, which you could look to potentially scale. Um, also, you see here, Decoval. Decoval is a really interesting um, uh, living lab, so to speak, in North Amsterdam. It used to be a contaminated area. The government put out a tender, um, and then it was transformed to 17 workspaces, a popular community cafe, and now really provides a living example of how to transform the post-industrial area into a mixed-use residential commercial area. And that's where maybe the work with the local city um, could come along to try to put something innovative in play. I wanna highlight these, I'm gonna go a little quicker now because there's a lot of data to share, I'm spending a lot of time, but I'm gonna highlight quickly what was on the private sector side, which we engaged on earlier today. Circular manufacturing, stimulating low impact material use, clean energy and material symbiosis. symbiosis. What's important is that we're talking about pollution today, but we got to talk about the design of the pollution at the inception from the beginning. How do we actually um, produce industry manufacturing where we're trying to design out waste from the very beginning? Hashtag design out waste in Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, platform. So again, when we look at this, we take a look at the inputs, materials and water of energy going through a city, and then the outputs, emissions, wastewater, and waste coming out. So again, what we're trying to figure out is how to limit those inputs to be something that puts a benefit coming out of it. In that context, here's that sinking diagram again. The part I wanna focus on here is, sorry, right here, is taking a look again here at, um, if you look on the left, on CO2 emissions. Industry, <laughs> industrial emissions accounts for over 55% of the current emissions in Cleveland. Um, residential only accounts for 11%.
And that's big. So what we need to do by focusing on the industries themselves, we can have a massive, massive effect on our CO2 emissions and our air pollution. So this is something that we need to work together on to, to transition. As you see in the bottom two, you see here waste generation in Cleveland. Industry um, is 48% of the current um, waste generation as well. So you can see that industry represents a lot of CO2 emissions and a lot of our waste. Um, I think what I really want to highlight here when you can you can read this for yourself, and again, we're going to share this with you afterwards, you're going to be getting all these PowerPoints. Um, I think there's a big opportunity here where um, um, employment, which we're going to get to in a second. Again, highlights. Um, we can look at decreasing carbon emissions by simulating our tender production methods and material consumption. I want to focus on jobs. There's a way here to take the industries and look at developing green jobs and providing training matching re uh, for resident skill sets. Uh, so there's opportunity to take a negative and make it a positive. And a way to look at lower the energy demand by increasing efficiency and shift to cleaner energy with decentralized electricity pr production. Uh, we do see a shift happening now where you see um, you know, the talk of peak oil ending or coming soon. Um, so when we look at 1.5 degrees Celsius and we all got to not get to that tipping point, um, this is something that we can look at taking and being proactively engaging on now to make a dent. Um, here are some examples. Um, only one I'm going to highlight here real quickly is uh, Kallenborg from 1970. It was the world's first echo industrial park. Um, 14 industrial partners got together and they started sharing energy water materials. They were saving over 635,000 tons of CO2 and 24.2 million euros in economic expenses per year just by industry coming together to reduce their energy drain. So I think that's something, for example, we can see in the space. Again, here's some examples though to look at if you're curious. The built environment on the other side, the one thing I wanna highlight here for the next focus area on the private sector is when you look at building materials at the bottom left, um, of the 119,000 tons of, of waste, concrete represents 76,800 tons of that, right? So waste materials, concrete is a very, very heavy um, waste resource that we're trying to figure out solutions for. So the built environment, there's a lot of opportunity here, though, not just to mitigate, but also to move forward. And so when you look at the hey, built environment, John, yeah, uh, there was a question while you're on this item of can you explain what you mean by developing the built environment to support socio and economic development? You might be getting to some of that, but just if you can make sure to emphasize that as you're getting through this piece. Absolutely. The one thing I want to highlight here is if you just take a look right now is the vacant land. The municipal land bank reports extensive vacant land under public control, 7,500 vacant lots. Also, for example, you have homelessness. There's a high homelessness and poverty rate, poverty rate of 18.3 and 20% uh, in 2019. So essentially what we could look to do with some of this uh, built environment is really trying to find a way Number one, a deconstructing initiative of taking existing material and using it again when we need to rebuild or use build more housing. But number two, look at this vacant land as a way to maybe solve homelessness. Maybe try to find some really interesting investment pools where we can work together in the built environment to represent those who do not have. And so that's actually what we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, when we talk about inclusion. But yeah, feel free to put your insights and then afterwards we can talk about more specificity, but we are looking to address that in these discussions. Great point, thanks Kristen. When we look at some highlights here, we talk about wealth building, leveraging urban development to increase household income through de densification and decreasing the value of housing captured by landlords through community land trust or by creating decentralized energy systems. So there's another way of using the built environment as a way to represent those who've been left out. Low impact construction strategies, implement policies to decrease the impact of the construction sector. Collecting data for urban mining by gathering information on which materials are used, where we can allow materials to be reused at high quality for multiple life cycles. And then green procurement guidelines. Obviously, look at making procurement guidelines represent the best or most stringent anti-pollution measures um, of all uh, that we possibly can and also promote innovative and sustainable materials. Um, some examples here that are going on, um, I think that are really important. Um, I think one, Material Passport um, uh, is an online platform that allows property data to be stored. The platform gives identity to the materials present in building to allow for potential high value reuse. 
Um, this is something that I think really can be a key to a city to explore on reusing some of that material. And then I wanna focus on DeWarren uh, Cooperative Living. It's a co-op living and sustainable building project initiative, initiative in Amsterdam. Through crowdfunding, loans, and private investment, um, the group is building a super simple apartment complex of 16 to 20 apartments that will provide long-term sustainable and affordable housing to the city. Again, this is not just the typical affordable housing run of the mill. It's designing it for the people for a better life. It's really, really uh, cool and, and, and engaging. And I encourage you folks to take a look at it as a model that maybe Cleveland can bring in. <sighs> so there you go. There is the share. I'm going to stop share for a second. I know I gave you a lot of information. I know you have a lot of questions that are populating in there. We're going to take some of those as we move forward. Um, again, you're going to share this. We're going to share this data with you, and we're going to be able to come back to you to answer some of those questions that we, we have moving forward. Um, I know that was a lot. I appreciate the time and effort on those. And again, we'll come back to you on those questions. Moving forward, though, I want to pause now for a second and um, allow Divya to take control. And Divya, if you can uh, now get us moved into our appropriate breakout sessions, we can dive into some of the details. All the on point. Thank you. So thank you for coming today. We really appreciate you joining us today, um, spending time with us. Um, as uh, Divya put out there, if you could please adjust your settings to put the organization you're with as we go forward, it'd be really great to be able to have that availability with us, um, just to know what organization you are and are with and et cetera. A couple of notes. When we do this engagement, some of you folks are more introverted than others. And um, what we do kindly ask is to engage. So if you don't feel like talking, you don't want to, to be a voice, we really do need your insights. So you can please put those in the chat moving forward when we go through the questions. Uh, we very much appreciate that. Um, today, uh, you know, I will be helping or being the lead facilitator of this along with um, Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, and Stephanie, if you quickly just give an introduction again, just to say hi. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Valentic. Um, I'm with Waste 360, and I'm also a Circul Circular Cleveland ambassador. And I'm here to take some notes today. Yay. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, give me one second. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. I'm trying to pull up my wonderful questions right here, and I have it. This is great. Wonderful. Okay. So how we're going to work today is essentially the following is that um, I'm going to give a question out and then give you some time to reflect. And if you can provide any answers or give your thoughts on it, that would be great. Again, uh, we have roughly 40 minutes together today. So we, the more voices and the diverse voices and diverse ways of thought uh, that we would have, the better for us. And um, we look forward to the engagement. So as we move forward, Let's start off with question number one. Um, what, in your view, are the most observed impacts of poor air quality, water pollution, and lead pollution for local re residents? I know this is a big question. So through your eyes, um, when you see poor air quality, when you see water pollution and lead pollution for the local residents, can you give us the ones that come up most often and maybe an example of what you see? And get and more spec understand the more specific you have the better and what you can do is if you could find your hand signal um, on your um, tab and raise your hand I can call you out um, if you can share. We see a couple of going in already, which is great, thank you for engaging this far so again, what are the pollution impacts that you see most often. In the city of Cleveland that you feel need to be prioritized and addressed the quicker quickest. Sick kids, asthma, behavior issues, health disparities. Thank you. High rates of asthma again are coming up. It's very common. One thing that would be helpful for us folks is to personalize it a little bit, meaning if you have an area, if you have something specific to share, that would be great as well. And again, if anybody wants to, to, to speak or lend their voice on the yeah, conversation. Yes, who, who's this? Who's this? Sorry. This is Dimitri. 
Hi, Dimitri. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, great. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Right. Thanks for joining. What's your thought? Um, so for me, one of the impacts of like um, water pollution would be um, the cleanliness of our lakes um, and our rivers of, uh, of the Cleveland area. I know that's a big issue. A lot of people are afraid to get in the water sometimes. Because they realize how dirty it is. Um, as far as air, air quality, one of the impacts that I see um, of that besides like asthma, um, it's just, I think, I think it's, I think the, uh, the better of our oxygen, the better we think. So, um, you know, it affects our mental attitude as well. Um, not having the clean air. Um, and then I think those are my two, um, big impacts, I guess you could say. Thank you for that. Okay. If we can parse those out a little bit, especially with the water supply. Um, so you're saying that, yes, it's not, sometimes people don't feel safe going in and obviously that's probably affecting the food systems around there too, for people fishing and whatnot. Correct. For sure. And then, uh, um, another thing also to lead into, um, one of the pollutions I, I'm, I'm every time you put up a sticky note, I'm having a blank on the question, but that's okay. okay. Um, um, just, I, I, I need to read it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Thank it's okay. you. Yeah. I wanted to tap on lead pollution. Thank you. So a lot of the kids um, in the central community, they battle with um, lead as well. And I know that, that that is affecting their education. So when they have this high concept of lead, they're not able to think as well. So a lot of the things are affecting our health um, in, a, in a broad spectrum. So just trying to, if we tackle these things, I know we'll have better education, safer environment overall, and it'll be more holistic. Thank you, Demetrius. So, I mean, and, and thank you for giving the systemic perspective. So we had water, you said the visible showings of air pollution. Um, and then you said, of course, lead pollution also affecting many of these children. And that affects obviously mental health. It affects a lot of outcomes as well. Um, energy levels, physical well-being. So thank you for that. Okay, we see a lot of comments going in. Thank you. Who else? Anyone else want to share any insights out loud that maybe can give some specificity to what Demetrius brought up or others that feel that they have a, an opinion of, of some of those that, that they can strike a, that strikes a chord with them? I'm happy to share. I, I live this, in Tremont. This sorry. is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Debbie Smith. Hey. Um, I live in Tremont and literally you walk out of our house and there is just a film of this sort of greasy dirt on you know all of our it's on the houses it's on our sills and on on our cars and and so i'm i just wonder we're breathing that in so what does that look like on the inside of our body and that's a, just a real physical way that we we see it down here all the time thank you for that thank you thank you for sharing that um you know i see what i'm seeing in the chat is some interesting very detailed and thank you folks for the details um, of of what the experiences are is it generally all of cleveland are there some neighborhoods that you think are more affected i see here for example from joe the north broadway neighborhood Let, let's 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 stay specific anything regarding let's say the quality of air is it writ large around cleveland are there specific areas that you think it affects the most I'm glad you asked that, John. Hi, this is Ephraim Abdullah. Can you hear me? Absolutely, sir. Thank you for joining. Hey, cool. Yeah, I think you uh, highlighted great when you responded to uh, Demetrius' uh, response as far as the lead poison that's in the area. You know, systemically, there are a, there is a graph that identifies how that lead poison uh, trends in prevalent Black communities and how it systemically uh is connected to uh, jail. Uh, a lot of uh, people untreated are going through mental conditions, which is proven uh, through uh, lead poison um, that it, as you get older, it causes areas where uh, you have a recidivism of um, male and females uh, going into the penal system um, repeatedly because they're not being addressed for their uh, condition that's being started with lead poison from some of the older homes and, and paint uh, and, and other processes that shows the high lead levels in uh, black communities like East Cleveland, uh, Glenville, um, you know, uh, Central. Those are highlighted areas. There's 
graph that shows how deep uh, in red it goes to um, addressing how many people are not being uh, healed or how it's not being addressed. So our black communities have suffered greatly from their poison as well as air quality. You know, we had to fight uh, with uh, University Circle and uh, where they have the Cleveland Clinic and the university health system where they used to use um, uh, the coal burners to uh, uh, power their uh, area and it was distributing uh, particles, micro particles smaller than two. And with that, you know, it was easier to breathe in, which caused health conditions for the communities like East Cleveland and the Huff community areas where there's a, a combination of elements between uh, air and lead poisoning that played a part in the systemic and uh, health quality. Wow, thank you for that. And we just captured some of those notes and I'm glad we're recording this so we can come back to it. I really appreciate that. And, and I really appreciate too highlighting um, not just lead, but also the air quality piece to it and the research that's been done on linking that from lead in those neighborhoods to um, potential incarceration rates. So this is all the good stuff that we need. Thank you for that, Ephraim. Oh, okay. Um, who else? Anybody else want to share on this one before we get to the next question? These are all great insights and we're trying to keep up. Um, by the way, again, Stephanie and I are copiously taking notes. We're going to be copying all of this and making sure that we get this out, but this is exactly what we're looking for. Anybody else want to share out based on the comments that were shared earlier? Anything? Could I jump in? Yeah, who is this, please? This is Sarah Tan from Hi, Old Sarah. Brooklyn Recycles. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, oftentimes indoor air quality is lower than outdoor air quality, <laughs> even, even um, in Cleveland. Um, and there's a, the case has a center that has studied some of this. I'm, I'm, the name is slipping my mind right now, but um, uh, they did a focus group on, on lead and air quality in Cleveland. Um, and you know, that, that's an issue, right? All the pollutants that we have inside our houses, especially, um, you know, like old carpets and fire retardant, um, things that were outlawed, but are still around. Um, and then I'd also say that, you know, I, most of my friends either have a child or know someone who has been affected by the lead poisoning. And we've moved, um, in both our houses in Cleveland had issues with lead and showed up in my children's um, blood levels. Um, and I think that in Cleveland, we need to be addressing this in the hospitals when people are receiving prenatal care. You know, how are they preparing their homes and how is this being subsidized? Because it's very expensive even to have someone out to test in a real, in a real way, rather than just dabbing a stick, you know, um, which can give you a false uh, negative, um, you know, and then, and then how are we addressing renovation or remediation? A lot to unwind there. So thank you for that. And I think again, the, the effect of, so what I heard is the effect on children and in hospitals. I also heard the fact that you know, how do you get real tests? How do you get that cost incurred to actually truly evaluate the situation and not just a checklist saying, oh, you're fine when in fact you're really not. And um, to be able to account for that. Okay, thank you. Jeez, this is all good stuff. Can I add to that? Yes, who's this please? Aaron Randall and Hi, Colin. Aaron. So um, similar to Sarah's experience, I had um, my, my kids, um, you know, we've had two houses in Cleveland that have had, um, you know, obviously lead uh, issues and lead dust. And I think um, I was like really optimistic at first. We were we were delaying having a third child to get the the house, you know, through the city program and all that. And um, it's basically as soon as we had that finished um, in our, our we felt like our property was safe. Um, that somebody bought the house next door and power washed it and just made a mess all over our yard. And when I asked him how he was going to pick it up, he said he was going to mow it. So, um, 
the thing I want to share is I feel like these the pollution issue is it just becomes one of two two things. It's hopeless for the people that know about it because it doesn't seem like there's anything we can do to get it. We're never going to get it addressed. There's never going to be enough money to to do it. So there's like this sense of hopelessness. And then on the other hand, there's no um, empowerment of families. There's like everybody's waiting to get everything together before we just tell people hey, lead dust, any kind of dust in your home has lead in it. So if you just, you know, you can stop, you know, let's narrow down what the problem is. And there's not like a, you know, it's all this, well, we have to have this huge thing um, instead of just engaging people and saying, well, you know, the real danger is at this age group and you can do these things to mitigate it. And it's not blaming the victim. It's just giving you some tools so that you feel like you're doing something and we can pass the word around the community. And that sort of never was never done. And I feel like it was a wasted opportunity. Like why not tell people that, you know, the time that your kid is crawling around on the floor and putting stuff in their mouth is the critical time that you gotta really stay on top of the dust in your house. You know, you have to really keep them out of dirt outside. You know, there's, the lead isn't magical, it's in things and we can keep them away from those things and we can keep those things away from the child. There's a certain you. amount of vigilance that I think we just never really messaged about. And I think it, it was a lost opportunity to like really deliver some clean messages. Instead, we got bulletin boards showing cans of spilling blue paint. I mean, so a big disconnect even between trying to understand what the solution is and how to actually deal with it from a true real conversation of how you can take action just as a citizen versus the reality of just kind of not providing the resource for it to actually do anything about it. and that doesn't even account for money investment into trying to solve the problem yeah aaron um this is uh terrell, terrell cole the city of cleveland um, and I'm definitely not speaking in, in my role and responsibility in, in the city, but, um, you know, I just had different, uh, experiences in, in, in life and, and, uh, what, what you said really, uh, touched me and I'm going to ask, um, folks to think about, uh, something, um, um, as we look at solutions, whether they're, they are, you know, top down grassroots or, or whatnot, I always want to reflect on the rhythm of life. Um, the, the gateways that we have for different accomplishments. And, and as we think about that, I want, I want us to think about how we acquire knowledge. Um, some of the things we take for granted in this particular country, um, you know, we, somehow kids know uh, what age they're eligible for a driver's license. I don't know how many people sat down and gave them that knowledge, but they, they just pick up, people pick up things. And I think we need to think about how we pick up certain things. And I'll just give you this quick little anecdote. I lived overseas and I lived in Africa when I was a kid. And I remember before we went over, um, so I'm eight years old and I know about malaria. I know that I need to take a pill uh, go, going over. I know I need to not drink the water directly and only drink from this sanitized location. I know that I cannot drink directly from the tap. I know that I cannot touch a lizard with a red head because it's poisonous and the other ones are fine. Like th there were prescriptive things that we had to know and to do to be safe. And it's just interesting that, in, that we'll buy a house or we'll buy a car and there are things that people know to do um, and there are things that our, our folks are exposed to and we don't know until it's too late. And so I just kind of, you know, go back to think about how we learn how to live and survive. And just so many of our folks are in survival mode and a lot of what's necessary to be safe in terms of, you know, getting your house painted is also an economic issue. But I think the need to paint is not necessarily something that's known, right? Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but, you know, really it's around the rhythm for this issue, for me, a, a big part of it too is, a, is the rhythm of life and how we know what we know when we need to know it. You go from being a renter to an owner, you decide where to rent, how do you know it's safe? Just all those, all those things. Uh, some of it is knowledge. Thanks, Terrell. Um, this is Ismail. I'm sorry. If I could just say one thing. Yeah, one respond. thing. Absolutely, Ishmael, and then from there, because we have three other questions, if you wouldn't mind, this is all really good, but we'll take Ishmael and then we'll move to the next question. Ishmael, go ahead, please, you have the floor. No, never mind. go ahead. I no, 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 please, you have the floor. Okay, sorry. No. I just, my, my, my knee jerk to that, thank you so much. My knee jerk to that really was, well, 
partly we shouldn't have to be educated on having the right to live in a space. So yes, we should be educating each other on what to do, but it, it it's it's habitual for us to just have a home and expect that it is what everyone else has. So yes, I just wanted to put that in there. I think that's a valid, a valid comment. I think it's the same thing when we look at saying recycling waste and saying, well, what's the incentive to recycle? What, what's the point of it? Um, it? I think it's something that we have to look at here where you have a baseline of understanding that that waste is going to be recycled, it's being done, and there's something happening. It's the same with, it's even more with living. You want a certain baseline of where you live and assume that, that it's built in the right way. But I think we have to work together to try to find those solutions to make sure everybody is getting an equitable chance at this. So thank you, Ishmael, for, for being real and sharing. And Terrell, thank you so much for sharing too. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Um, again, we have your notes here and I and want to thank you for your honesty. Um, I've asked for it. We need to continue doing that. Um, which existing initiative, initiatives do you consider to have a high impact on mitigating commotion in Cleveland and being inclusive to local communities? So the question is, we heard a lot about what's not working. Which makes sense. And we got to hear about those. And we heard that, you know, a lot more education needs to exist, a, a, a lot more understanding of, of what lead looks like needs to exist. Are there anything that you feel right now that you're saying, this is good, this is helpful for us, this is a program that's really something we want to lean into, and then double down on, invest more in? So any examples of initiatives you consider to be high impact that are great, that are helping to mitigate? And again here, um, it's something that you've seen something that, okay, this is good. I like it. It makes sense. Let's do more of it. It may not be invested in the way it should be, but you want to see more of it. This is Laura Rankin. I can speak to Hi, water Laura. quality. Hi. Great, and some Laura. things that are going well for us. Thank you. Um, as many of you know, the river catching on fire was a critical move towards sustainability, not just in Ohio, but in our entire country and sparked the foundation of the EPA, as well as the Clean Water Act. And I think we've definitely had trials and tribulations here in Cleveland, but over the past, I would say three to five years, we're definitely seeing a lot of positive progress in the space and a lot of public private sector collaboration of organizations that are coming together to advance water quality and equity in Lake Erie. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Um, Sarah also had a point of saying, the sewers, watershed being reconstructed, um, the project Clean Lake from uh, NERSD. Sarah, thank you for your comment. Sarah O'Keefe, thank you for that. What else? Is there anything else that you think, hey, this is good? This is something we need more of? Again, I think one hey. thing, sorry, who's this? This is Demetrius Carter. Hey, Demetrius, good hearing you again. Uh -huh. So what I see that's um, having a high impact on um, pollution or like can help pollution out, um, uh -huh. like with waste at least. Yep. I see there's a Red Off Farm that's on East 79th um, and uh, well near East 79th, more of East 80th. There's that. I do see a little bit more of the lead initiative to like, or, or people like individuals, like residents or um, resident leaders saying, like talking about lead, that's working. I mean, it's doing something, but um, I know it, everything could always be a little bit better, right? Like that's what, that's what we're just trying to do, just make it a little bit better. Um, so that, and then I think, I think when it comes to energy, I feel like a lot of the people have been talking about cleaner and greener energy. Um, I, I do see windmills throughout the greater Cleveland area. I, I know that's, that's something that helps out. Um, I would like to see more solar panels and stuff like that. But I, I think in the last, in my last five years of living here, I've seen a better um, eco-friendly um, mindset, but I know it can always grow. Awesome. Thank you for doing that, Demetrius. I mean, I want to make one point too, which is, you know, to explain the loaded gun, I think when you saw a lot of um, examples in Europe, Europe is not the United States as we all know. And all of these, oh, this is green over here. This is nice over there. The reason why they've invested a lot in green is because there's a lot of tax dollars going towards those initiatives. I want to make very clear when we look at it high above, when we look at sectors, we're all in this together. And I want to be very clear that, you know, public sector funding when about in the 80s, when there was a transition to say governments can't help people and private sector started investing a lot more into the space of taking out the social good and social contract by just reducing taxes. I want to also stress a little bit that 
cities are also underfunded um, compared to Europe. And so I want to provide that really tight comparison of Europe versus the United States. So we're all framing this correctly and being on the same page. I don't want us to get disappointed, like, well, what's going on over there? What's happening? Um, we have to work together with the resources that we have. And I think a lot of the stuff that we have to do moving forward, private sector needs to help us find a way and pay for some of this as well. So when we're having this public social sector dialogue, the private sector is implicit and explicitly needs to be involved as well to help us with some of these solutions. And I just wanted to put that out there for a second, just to provide framing. Um, just, a, just a quick question to that, John. Are, yeah. When you say the private sector, we're referring to like the, the smaller cities, like Cleveland mm -hmm. Heights slash Lakewood slash- I'm like that, talking or... about companies writ large, especially okay. a lot of large multinationals. Um, a lot of the taxes that used to go into the cities in the 50s, 60s, and 70s has been stripped um, for tax gains. And I think that's important when you see we're sending people to the moon making billions of dollars. I'm not trying to harp politics. I'm trying to harp reality a little bit of just doing apples to apples comparisons of looking at those slides, which is really looking out of touch sometimes when we're saying all these great engagements in, in Amsterdam. Well, the reality is there's funding for those initiatives. What we have to look here together is work together to find funding for your initiatives here too, to make them worthwhile. So we're all locked in half. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, hey, John, you make, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is Ephraim again. Ephraim Abdul again. You make an excellent point there. You know, one of the things like you were saying back in the 60s and 70s, there were more um, entrepreneurs in the black communities then that were able to carry um, their weight a bit in when there are people who own the private organizations realizing that it's their community, then that would give the insight for uh, those organizations to buy in and pay towards the repair for their own community. But when you got a lot of the infrastructural um, facilities that are no longer um, being funded or have the capability to uh, do entrepreneurship, then you don't have as many um, community-based private organizations that could pay into their own community that would kind of help solve their own problem. So you're hitting it on the nose when you say that, you know, uh, the uh, rate of, um, entrepreneurship is now growing again but at the same time you know are the dollars coming to support those businesses to become more instrumental in their growth so that when their businesses are doing well they can invest in their own community as well because you know you're looking for a corporation that's not a part of this community here on the circulation side you know it's like you, you're a, a neighbor come over to tell you that their uh, toilet is running over and they need some help fixing so that they can pay their, and, and you know, your neighbor don't want to know about your running toilet, but right. it's someone in the, you know, so it's all about really just aligning things to where they can become resources to themselves and the circulation of things can really help prevent a lot of things that are preventable by the basic, um, Systemat systematic approach of doing the right thing. Absolutely. And thank you for that. I think, you know, we could, we could talk about this in detail. And I think it's something that's meaningful to frame is that when we're looking to do a circular Cleveland and what's great about the leadership putting this together is to try to re-stimulate those economic activities in those communities, in those black communities by looking at how private sector can take ownership of those again, um, how those sectors can, you can own this, this transition and how to make it more sustainable. And that comes with all sectors empathizing with one another's complicity in, in, this, in this conversation. So thank you for bringing out the, the historical perspective. Um, I want to continue now because of time. I want to get into the next question. Thank you for your input there and, and throwing some positivity into the mix. Um, it, we, we have to have both. And I want to get into the third question here. Uh, we have mentioned a few examples, best pra practices of a living lab, um, the Colville, some drainage garden, aquaponic gardens. Um, do you see any opportunities that you saw from those best practices that you think we could bring here? that you think would be good to benefit this conversation here. For example, we saw the repair lab 
um, where we would set up a, a organization that would help entrepreneurs set up circular businesses, reduce and reuse repair stuff. Is there anything here that resonated with you that goes, yeah, that would be good. We could do something like that here. And let's Hi, this is a, you go ahead. This is, this is David from St. Clair Superior. Hi. Uh, hello. Um, so when you say, when you say we, who, what do you mean by, by we? We meaning Cleveland. We meaning you. So we, we meaning when we look at the circular transition and mitigating pollution, and we shared some examples earlier of aquaponics. We shared some examples of people gave some ideas of cleaning up watersheds and environment. We also saw some examples of repair cafes going in to some of those cities to talk about the anti-gentrification of reuse models of reuse businesses. Are there any models that you saw in those examples that stood out that when you saw that you go, yeah, 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 that's something we could do here. Uh, the second part of that is sort of like, um, and, and who's footing that bill when you say, when you say Cleveland, yeah. you know, I think my, 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 my counter to that is like, who's really footing that bill? Because when we talk about like, you're saying, you were saying like the, the private sector. And so like, my, my thought is like, yes, it's, it's all well and good to talk about how we all need to like hold hands and have this um, very, very idealized, you know, think about it, but like who is really footing the bill of like, if we were to have say a co-op living space, who is that really for and who does that really benefit and who's able to actually live in that space? Excellent. So, so I think that, yeah, they're like everything, it does sound good, but like the, the bigger question for me before I even begin to think about an answer sure. for that is like, who actually is paying for that and where is it going? Does it, benefit, does it benefit Cleveland or does it benefit somebody else who is like footing that bill? Okay, that's a great question and great insight. And uh, we will definitely be capturing that. Here's the answer to that or the retort to it. That's up to us to think about. And let's talk a little bit about next steps. And we were going to get into this a little bit later. The opportunity at present is that right now in this space, because of multiple trends happening right now where real conversations are coming out about race, real conversations are coming about the fact that historically, so Black and Latinx communities don't have any money for startup funding. Um, there's a lot of opportunity coming in the space of potential funds for folks to actually start taking ownership of this, some of this circular engagement pieces of it. You see, for example, again, a big bank, <laughs> JP Morgan Chase, what they're trying to do in Detroit, and what they've done in Chicago by supporting community development funds and, and, st and startups in, in the Black community. There's some legitimate business interventions happening in those spaces. Again, the end of the day is your question is ownership. I hear you on that one. This is not something that we're not looking to address. We don't want the gentrification to happen where let's say you take an idea, you bring it into play, you put your time and effort to it, and then suddenly all of a sudden you're, you're removed from it or you don't have the ownership of it. That's all what we're trying to figure out here. Um, we're trying to look and come to a place together in an idealistic context, which I know is hard, trust is earned, but we got to try to figure out some things here. And we don't have to answer this question now. What we can do is hold on this one. Um, if, if you, if you want to think about it a little bit, if this is something that is a business idea that you're saying, well, I don't want to share this yet, or I need to see to be determined um, just in clear and, and opaque context, then we can, we can hold on this one and maybe come back to it or um, readdress well, it by bringing that up again. Just, just briefly, I just wanted to say what I, I felt like was a good idea was the refillable cleaning supplies, like uh -huh. bring your own container and you pay for, um, you pay for the uh, cleaning supplies at a cheaper amount. I feel like yeah. that's great for um, schools uh, and other, and, and jobs as well. I mean, you know, like businesses um, to have that near, I don't know where we'll be positioned at, but I think that's a good idea to bring. Um, okay. To Thank you for that. Can we talk for a second about diapers? Yes, of course. Talk about diapers. Go right ahead. So cloth diapers like are um, super fun to use. They have invented something that's been around for like 30 years. This little, it looks like a little bungee strap, little, little baby size bungee strap that you use to hold them close. So there's no more pins and um, they're really economical. So really no one makes any money off of the sale of cloth diapers. Um, and there's a lot of people that don't have laundry facilities. So like, what would it take to get a diaper service up and running and serving the community in the way that um, the hospitals have gotten hmm. a co-op 
together to serve that because I feel like those chemical diapers are just, they're really expensive and they're really bad for the environment. And they like comprise, like we haven't even begun to describe how much of the landfills are filled with chemical diapers. Um, but they're just plastics and, you know, there's lots of really fun ways to do cloth diapers nowadays, even if you just do them when the kids are really little and they're, there's just so much we could be doing with like little babies that, and, and having, um, my, my community's had like a, we call it the newborn stash, the, the box of newborn diapers has made its way around, you know, for a dozen kids already. And they look brand new because newborn babies only are that size for a few months. Um, so anyway, I just want to speak up for cloth diapers. I want to, I want to put a pin in this. So real quickly is that what you're saying, this is the reuse market. The reuse market is one of the most powerful economic indicators that has to happen for our earth to start being sustainable. Reuse models around diapers, around what you're already seeing and identifying, where the entrepreneurism is, is what you're sharing right now. Um, we saw, we heard about a diaper, a natural diaper intervention happening and being developed in Barcelona with a, I think it was either via the Ellen MacArthur Foundation or some others, there's, there's a case study on it. I'll get the case study and we'll try to send that out um, so some ideas of that, of what's that's happening, but maybe something for you folks to localize. Thank you for the idea. Great point. Great, great example. Okay. We have one question left. I would like to take the time to focus on that last question. Thank you thus far for sticking with us and being real. Whew. So a lot of pollution stems from past industrial activity. This is a loaded question because we're gonna ask you, what does local industry play in mitigating this? What could the role of local government play? And are there any successful cross-sector opportunity for partnerships? What I wanna focus here on the conversation is, when you look at pollution stemming from past industrial activity, I wanna focus a little bit on potentially what you think um, the private sector could do potentially to mitigate their activities and create maybe funding streams. So what, the, what could the local industry play in mitigating this? What do you think they could do for themselves to make it better for you that they could actually buy into? So what we're looking at here is saying, you know they're polluting. What is your voice back to say, hey, stop polluting, try doing this instead? Any ideas? Yes. Hi, yeah, this is Ephraim. Ephraim. Love it. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, you know, when we had the problem, the issue with uh, the, the, the coal burning, they had eight coal burning uh, things at uh, University uh, Heights. What they ended up doing was eliminating the coal burning uh, uh, things that they were using to empower or uh, give energy to uh, their institutes and they went solar. Uh -huh. So they ended up doing solar, but before they did, we had to go to the EPA. We had to have uh, meetings about the hazard that it was bringing. We had to, you know, identify how we, how we were concerned about the causes that it was bringing on for them to function, you know, and then, you know, we were identifying, you all got like, the Cleveland Clinic, as well as university hospitals, you know, involved here. So if you all are using those kind of energies that are polluting uh, smaller or uh, less diverse communities um, to, to profit from, you know, how would that look for you on the national stage to, to recognize that you all are using uh, uh, energy that's causing certain communities to have uh, asthmas and other uh, irregularities in their health, but you're promoting that you're a number one health community in the world. So, you know, we had to kind of like identify speaking to them, but in the process, we weren't mean or anything. We just wanted to stay consistent and identify, hey, we want this address. And they went along with and addressed it in a manner um, we went through the right steps with the EPA and had hearings and things of that sort. And next thing you know, there was a solar uh, mm -hmm. a farm erected. And at the same time, um, 
you know, th this is a part of our studies with Sustainable Cleveland, 19, 2019. Right. You know, um, I think that that was a good resolve, but, you know, to come back behind it, you know, they ended up putting the dump inside of East Cleveland, which was another uh, hazard, but we even addressed it and, and, and went to the news and, and, and wrote about it and identified, hey, don't put those hazards in our community. So, yes, it's a bother. And, you know, there's always someone profiting off someone's uh, um, loss, which is very bad in this, you know, a corporate shame. But I think that there should be legislation that identifies <laughs> where people should uh, serve time when they pr <laughs> produce uh, pollutions and, and profit from it. You know, like when Barack Obama became president mm -hmm. and, and they had that oil spill and they say they didn't know how to shut it off. And when he told them, hey, every time, every every ounce of what it's going to cost us to clean up is going to come out of your dividends, they found the solution. So, you know, if, if money is what caused them to do it, then money should be the cost for them to repair it. Excellent. Let me give let me let me take some feedback of that. And thank you so much for putting context there, because there's a couple of things to point out just on trends in this space. Everybody can be in the same page right now. There's a trend happening right now. It's not even a trend. It's going into what's called echo side. So, you know, we have genocide. Echo side is where legally now nonprofits, for example, can sue companies them directly representing the public interest of environmental harm. This is a big change in the legal space. This is coming out on the horizon now. So what you're saying about crime, that's something that eventually hopefully can make its way to the United States. The other thing that I wanna bring out is positive. Companies right now in the space um, are incentivized, not just by bad public or reactive public relations to do something. There is an economic way by being a good citizen and reducing their carbon emissions, by dealing with lead poisoning, by taking care of the city's constituents that they actually get more money for it. And that's through this idea of ESG, where there's specific metrics in play where companies can say, yes, we're 100% renewable energy. Investors will invest more money into them because they're perceived to be doing good. And so I think the timing is right for advocacy to come out, um, again, to engage those companies and be more specific of, here's the XYZ problem we're having. If you solve this, this is the value you can get to your shareholders. This is kind of how we're trying to work ourselves as a nonprofit to be an advocate for communities is to try to speak their language. Instead of yelling, we partner with Greenpeace to yell. They're great at it. We try to work on the inside to say, OK, here's the economic benefit by actually taking care of you folks. And so these are really good insights that we need to work on together to, 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 to glean out of here. And also you brought up some really good ideas. Thank you, Efren. I want to leave more time for others. Demetrius, I saw you come off again. Yep, I am here. Um, I'm going to try to step up really fast and then step back again. But I feel like as far as the government concerned, uh, the local government paying more attention to detail as far as the land um, is concerned, whether it's an empty lot or a field, sometimes a lot of, a lot of uh, the landscapers will roll, like roll right over the paper. It can be aluminum cans. They don't care. They'll just roll right over and they'll chop them up into bits and then that goes into the soil. And I don't think they pay attention into what's going on as their landscaper, you know, this is supposed to be a beautification of the area. It's not yes. supposed to be just cut the grass by any means. That's not how it works. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, stop with the uh, quick and dirty um, cutting grass and start with the actual beautification of the area so people can be proud of it. And then that, I think that just goes into a, a factor um, with having some type of um, junior cleanup crews, if you will, um, just, just as much as we can invest into the uh, older adults and to cleaning up our city, that can also be invested into the youth. So then that way they're, they're not, um, you know, doing things like just playing video games all day or uh, just doing anything. I don't know, something that they can do more productive things. I mean, for instance, myself, I had a, a summer youth program and I'm gonna um, stop talking, but I had a summer youth program. And one of those things was just talking about the importance of cleaning up our environment and um, making sure that we, we understand that we have a responsibility, even if we're only 10 years old and above. But um, Excellent. Yeah. 
No, that's, that's great. Those are really good opportunities. And thank you, by the way, so much for your continued engagement. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to highlight a couple things in the chat. Sarah, thank you so much. Divesting in organizations that support continued pollution is, is, can be a good idea. You know, exhibit where your dollars go. Making sure school buildings and daycares are healthy, right? I think one thing that we're seeing is this whole idea too of zero waste schools in inner cities to get students to where they're by having zero waste practices in, in those cities and the actual students becoming more aware of waste, more incentives go to those schools to where teachers get paid more by a company actually caring about, I mean, by a school caring about the resources and putting curriculum in. These are some things that can potentially be put in there. So thank you for sharing. Sarah, you have your hand up. Or not, or she's just giving a high five. Yeah, uh, I, David again here. I think that, um, you know- um, Hi, David, in, Go ahead. In, the, in the inner city, I think um, going to the point of talking about instead of for schools, um, there's already a lot of um, pressure in inner city schools to compete for money. Yep. So um, I don't actually do oppose something like that because inner city schools get shut down so quickly. Yep. And there's a huge problem with like getting kids into the schools in the first place. So I think yep. like having the incentive for, you know, getting them involved in different ways versus like um, making it a point to like pay teachers more and stuff. And we have a huge problem with even paying teachers just a minimum wage of what they should be paid in the yeah, first fair. place. Um, but I do think that like, um, we have a huge problem with, um, I'm over in St. Clair Superior. So Sith College just around the corner for me and, um, the students who are over here at, um, St. Martin de Forest have for years been complaining about, you know, the sound of the, the presser because the, but because they make specific parts for auto for like planes that nobody else makes sure it's, that one is like if i could make if i could wave a magic wand i would never hear that press again in my life you know or see like the billowing smoke coming out of it and so i would love for something to happen in that regard but you know i think that you know that's like that's more than pie in the sky but i would love to see something happen where they are um motivated to stop spewing spewing out toxic fumes and using that press every day amen Thank you for that, David. Really appreciate your insights. Okay, any other insights on this one? We've had a really robust, engaged discussion, and we're going to be, I think, here in a second being thrown back into the main stage, but I want to make sure that we've captured everybody's um, ideas. Um, any other final parting comments from anybody before we go back to the main stage? And again, I want to thank you uh, sincerely for the authentic engagement, sharing your reality, sharing your thoughts of what you think. So for us to work together as a team to try to may, uh, represent your ideas and your voices and make sure that you know, Cleveland can be a, a positive value add on environmental um, issues and environmental justice and, not, uh, and, and work on creating some innovating solutions. Any other comments? I've asked enough of you thus far. I think everybody's tired. Okay, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. We're going to go back into the main room now, and then uh, we're going to share out some uh, overarching thoughts to make sure we're capturing what we've heard today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Everyone's coming back in. And again, thank you so much for taking your afternoon and spending time with us, having some really important, deep, and real conversations with us in, the, in our sessions. This is great. Okay, I think we pulled, Divya, have we pulled everybody back out of the rabbit holes? Yeah, good, okay. Well, on that note, I want to jump in and we're going to have some quick share outs. It's, we're making great time right now. It's 4.30. Uh, what I want each team to do, I want each team to take each question. So each uh, uh, moderator um, or note taker, um, co-facilitator, whatever we want to put it. I think, you know, Stephanie, I think we'll, we'll, we'll tee up first on going on pollution. It's just to share out one insight from each question, make it quick to the point of something that resonated with the group. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll transition to uh, uh, the, the other team. So Stephanie, you have the floor, okay. please. Okay, so um, question one uh, was, uh, 
we, we discussed the uh, observed impacts of poor air quality, uh, water pollution and lead pollution on local residents. Um, and there are a lot of um, uh, comments about sick kids uh, regarding asthma, respiratory, but also the behavior and mental health side um, and, other health, uh, and other disparities that happen um, with uh, poor air quality, with lead pollution and with the uh, poor water quality. Um, so that was question number one. Um, question two, uh, which existing initiatives do you consider to have a high impact on mitigating pollution in Cleveland? Um, there was a lot of talk about the number of windmills that have been going up in the area. Um, there's more of a talk of an eco-friendly mindset in the past couple of years. Uh, and also a uh, fleet conversion to electric and, and investing in infrastructure for electrical charging um, with Ohio EPA grants. So question three, uh, a couple of examples of best practices um, and opportunities that stand out. Um, funding for drainage gardens, uh, a huge, uh, a huge point in, in this uh, discussion was the uh, accessibility for cloth diapers and a possible co uh, cooperative to uh, improve uh, accessibility for cloth diapers to parents in the area and other resources and um, to actually um, inform uh, people for, uh, about more sustainable initiatives. Uh, and then the fourth question uh, regarding uh, pollution stemming from past industrial activity. Um, some comments involved uh, divesting in organizations that support continued pollution um, and local government having to pay more attention to detail in regards to land maintenance, um, which involves the focus on beautifying and not just upkeeping uh, vacant lots. Excellent. Um, real, real quick note, and thank you so much, Stephanie, for the summary. Um, I also want to really bring out the fact that uh, the, the conversation was really, I appreciate everybody's insights and being real. And also there were a lot of barriers at play. There's a lot of long history of a feeling that a lot of these issues have not been dealt with correctly. And I really want to thank you all for sharing out. I know we can't capture all those thoughts on a quick share out. And we'll be sure to look to do that as we do moving forward. Um, now I want to transition to, to uh, Morgan and uh, uh, Kristen, you have the floor. Thank you, John. Um, I would uh, echo your comments uh, for our group. I think we had some really great conversation. Um, I'm going to try to fly through these relatively quickly. Um, and Morgan, at the end, if there's anything I missed, please chime in. Um, so had some really good representation in our group. Our main focus was around food and organic uh, waste streams in particular. Um, on, on question one, definitely a lot of focus on the food side. I think we see uh, a lot of potential there, just uh, given the volumes of waste and I think uh, the need in our community to to utilize those things so that was kind of a theme throughout is um, you know the volume of stuff that we have and making sure that we have sort of users on the back end for all of those things uh, that we're generating um, on question Two, uh, this was, you know, I think we had plenty of challenges, some uh, stemming from just the seasonality here in Cleveland. Uh, obviously, things don't compost as well when they're cold. Um, but also, in, um, you know, I think trying to be clear with our folks what should and should not be going in there as we try to scale this up to a more general audience, um, you know, wish cycling, wish composting, wish donating are things that we, we tend to see. Um, happening and it, it causes some challenges when we try to make this uh, more uh, to operationalize it. Um, on question three, um, you know, I think we've got lots of ways local businesses uh, can, can participate and a theme that came up in our private sector discussion as well is around really making sure that we have re tools and resources for our business sector, um, especially the small and medium sized businesses. Uh, large corporations, they've got the resources to do some of those uh, ESG, environmental and social governance uh, practices, uh, small businesses are sometimes just trying to keep the lights on. So the more that we can uh, help kind of feed them uh, tools to, to be able to adopt these, the more successful that we're going to be. Um, and then finally, on question four, um, you know, I think 
a lot, we, we focus a lot on vacant land and some of the opportunities for vacant land here in Cleveland, how to reuse it. But, um, you know, we had some really good insights in uh, being strategic in how we use that. You know, what are we optimizing it for? Is it to, to store carbon and, and grow things? Or maybe it's for stormwater management. Maybe it's for economic development. I think the more we, um, you know, can have a, a decision tree to, to understand, you know, this plot has this much potential, uh, the better we'll be able to, um, to tap into those, those lands and use them as, as successfully as possible. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, facilitators and uh, note takers and share outs. Thank you so much. It's a lot to digest. It's a lot to chew on. And uh, thank you for doing that. Well, as promised, we'd like to continue and, and kind of, uh, you know, take a second now to kind of reflect and, and, and head back to um, next steps. My uh, PowerPoint has seemed to vanish from me. So uh, I'm going to ask a colleague to take the lead if you have PowerPoint to share. One second. Of the deck, I just had technical difficulties. I am. Sorry, let me look. Divya, do you have it? If not, I can bring it up. It'll just take me a second. I do not have it handy, but um, All right. very sorry about that. I'm looking for it right now. But it, while you're while we're I got it. I'm done. fine. Thank I found you. it. It uh, disappeared and it came. I brought it back to life again. Apologies. Thank okay. You. So here we go again. We're almost there and presenting. Great. Loading and loading and we did the working session. Reflections. And so we just reflected out. Thank you so much. And I want to hand it off to Divya. If you can take us home, Divya, um, and kind of uh, wrap up of where are we going? Uh, where are we now and where are we going? Floor is yours. Wonderful. Um, where we are here now today, listening to the depth of conversation in each um, in each breakout group, it was it was we are ready we are here we're here to build on what you have uh, what you're already working on um, there is ways for us to go so um, as we move forward as the roadmap captures all your insights and feedback um, this is the second one thank you for coming here today the next one will be on november 13th all your insights and feedback will get fed into this process and um, the next time we meet we'll talk around how implementation can look like for Cleveland and what um, and um, again this is just elevating your stories um, we um, the the community grants that have uh, the 14 grantees that are um, with us um, in this initiative um, they will be reporting out um, in, towards in the towards the end of this year um, there's a lot to learn from there as well um, we will have um, we have ambassadors who have been here with us for the first quarter um, as they, they're only getting stronger. We, are, we saw that in their participation today. Um, so we will continue to keep sharing resources. This was a call for us to sort of bring in more resources to keep sharing with you. Um, that will take us, um, so that brings us to January where we will be sharing out the roadmap. Um, that will be, we will be in year two of our process at that point, um, beginning to work on implementing that roadmap, bringing a working group together that talks, that is talking about how we can implement all, everything that you talked about today and, and how circular Cleveland can actually support the work that you're doing. How does it help take us to addressing air quality, um, pollution, and, uh, you know, creating more community resourcefulness um, uh, within here. Um, we will also be at that point uh, uh, launching with the um, city of Cleveland, uh, the economic development incentives. We talked about how important that is um, in order for us to scale up to new equitable green jobs. Um, incentives through this um, um, process will allow some of the groups here uh, potentially in ways to participate in that process. Um, Composting, I failed to mention, Westside Market will be kicking off a composting process through an RFP process. Um, that's exciting for everybody. That just sort of just amplifies the amount of organic waste that we have within the community. Um, I can talk a little bit to the racial equity training. Um, we've, um, for several years now, for all the initiatives that we work on through CNP and um, anytime we partner with the city as well, we work with Third Space Action Labs to have, um, um, you know, our partners go through the racial equity training. 
Um, our ambassadors have gone through the four hour groundwater training and we hope that as we bring more private um, sector partners also into this conversation. Um, several uh, partners here on this call mentioned um, historic disinvestment in our communities, um, history of racism here, um, the racial equity um, conversation, I mean, um, workshops, the Third Space Action Lab will only allow us to sort of begin to dip our toes in that. Um, so we our, our grants also cover for um, um, a few of those um, trainings to be imparted to um, the participants. Um, and then um, we will continue to do that through year two as well. Um, and we will keep building on the project. We will keep sharing. Year two is going to be a year for us to bring in resources together, share more um, knowledge that we hear from our partners, uh, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, a scan from what's going on across. So we will be sending a lot of information your way and counting on your participation as we move forward. Year three is really um, a close out of this project initiative in grant terms. But we are we know you've been working on this for a while. We know that you, you're, you're carrying um, this initiative um, without you'll call it circular economy. You'll not call it circular economy, but you're building the capacity within the community. Um, but we are joining a group of cities that are calling it circular and you know, um, giving it some weight there. Um, next slide, please. So our next steps, immediate next steps, um, we are here today. Uh, we've had two workshops this morning. Uh, I mean, since um, today, the next um, workshop, working session, will be on November 17th. Um, hold the day generally for, um, you know, for that. Um, we will send out um, notes on when exactly. Um, and, in, and in the interim, if we want to do deep dives with any of you, we will. Uh, we hope you're open to uh, sharing some time with, uh, with us so we can learn a little bit more. I want to throw out the Sustainable, um, Sustainable Cleveland Summit is coming up next week, 20th and 21st. Um, please make sure to um, register for the summit. If you don't have the information, reach out to us. We will... Um, um, you know, you, you'll get an email. Um, well, the information's already here on in the chat. Um, January, we will share. Um, it's time for the um, roadmap release. And with that, we are ready to move on. Um, I really, again, very sincerely want to thank you for the time that you have spent here with us today, bringing in your insights, um, sharing with us what you'd like to see moving forward. Um, and I, and I, Hope you'll continue to engage with us as deeply as you have. And thank you. Um, hey, Divya. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so we did have a question from uh, Rachel Summer about the racial equity tool, and I can, um, can weigh in on it. Uh, so Rachel, uh, you did not, you haven't missed much. Um, I think uh, what I will say to that, it's the racial equity tool is mirrored after what we did with the Cleveland Climate Action Plan, and I'll drop um, a link to that in the chat here. Um, essentially, this is a, a tool that we use to uh, evaluate all of our actions for the Climate Action Plan to make sure that we were um, putting equity first in, in all the work that we were doing. Um, based on kind of what we learned from that process, we uh, had proposed to include that in the Circular Cleveland process as well, because we do want to make sure that our efforts are are, are going to be as equitable as possible, especially when we get into those implementation phases. Um, so I think uh, it's going to be basically building off of what we did with the climate action plan with just some tweaks to make it more appropriate for the Circular Cleveland initiative. So uh, if that has not yet been developed for Circular Cleveland. Uh, I would say we're probably going to work on that in the next uh, next couple months here to make sure that it uh, fits in with the as we head towards uh, implementation strategies. Um, and uh, we'll share that with the group once it's uh, finalized. So I am sending that now. Thank you. Um, I 